Okay, open your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. This lesson will be hopefully the last one on this 8th chapter. Especially since I spent uh, be the fourth one, right? Is that, did I say four or did I say three? This will be the fourth one. This is Christ the Mediator, part four. Um, especially with me preaching two messages on <laughs> Hebrews 8 uh, last week. Yeah, I, it, it's an amazing thing. Um, the problems and difficulties uh, that we as children of God face in our own lives, is it not? I I know people don't like to to hear those that are what they would consider Christian, but yet they have questions about our Christianity, use the kind of language that I, I'm going to use with you right now. But, uh, but sin is ever-present with us, isn't it? If we're honest. I mean, I, we, we have such a tendency to think uh, high thoughts of ourselves that we when we see some sort of improvement. But on the other end of that spectrum, when we fail, when we sin, and sin grievously in ways that nobody knows but, but we ourselves and our God who is of pure eyes and to look upon evil, we write such hard things against ourselves. While God's word has made it clear to you and me that whosoever believeth on the name of the Son of God hath life. Now, yeah, people say, well, that's just, that's easy belief. That's, that's what the scriptures state, isn't it? I mean, you think about it. It doesn't say you're in the process of getting life or you're trying to increase life. We've been given life, and this life is where? It's in the sun. Now, that doesn't give me and you license to do whatever we want to do. It doesn't give us license to throw uh, our lives away with reckless abandonment. We ought to have a desire and a design in our hearts and in our lives and in our minds and in our understandings to always seek to glorify and honor God. I, I think about that a lot. And every time I think about it, I think how miserably I failed. I think about it, he tells us, whatever you do, whatsoever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, I'd say that takes in everything, pretty much, isn't it? I mean, that, that's a pretty broad spectrum there. Whether you eat, whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatever you do, do all of it. How? To the glory of God. And yet we find ourselves, you know, while it's true that the Lord has promised us thou would keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, doesn't it seem like the attacks become more fervent against us from outward things and within our own conscience when we seek to even practice those things to stay our minds on him? Because, see, here's the thing. Satan cannot have us. He can never bring the child of God back under condemnation. He can never separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I have to shout hallelujah to that. That's just a... That's a yea and amen there moment. He cannot have us, but I tell you what, he can certainly cause us anguish in our own hearts and in our minds. And that's the thing that always is so prevalent in our, my, my mind as a child of God. It's not too hard for him to do that, to cause us grief and anguish. Because he's got a strong ally that still remains in us. And all he's got to do is convince that ally, hey, you're not a child of God. A child of God would never do that, would never say that, would never think that. You ever been there? <laughs> and so we need strong consolation. We need something to comfort us. We need to have a, a, uh, a good hope through grace, ever and always. And so Paul, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, is seeking to encourage that which was on the verge of what he saw of possibly departing from the faith. 
Not that they lost their faith, but departing from the only hope. And that's the thing that you and I see. Our, our hope for our families and our friends lies one place. Huh? It's not in that I'm going to be the best sermon that they can see. Our hope and our prayer and our desire is that the Lord will enable them to see the futility and the folly and the failure of anything that they can do or even be enabled to do to save them or keep them saved or qualify them for eternal life. I want men and women and young men and women to be their hope to be found one place where in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so we, that's, why we, that's why we stand so dogmatically and we try to preach as clearly as we can these glorious truths that magnify and honor both the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you look anywhere else, you know, I mean, you think of the types and the pictures in the Old Testament. If, if you had looked anywhere than to lift your eyes toward where that brazen serpent was lifted up in the midst of the camp, what good would it do you? And for the child of God, we are looking unto Jesus, the author and the completer of our faith. Let us run the race with patience. And we have a tendency to be so impatient, do we not? And so Paul is seeking to show these Hebrew believers, and you and me as well, that there was never any saving value or anything of savability or they use that big word that I get thrown on me and I had to go look up a definite. There, there's nothing salvific. And that's the word they like to use, them, them theologians out there. There's nothing salvific in any of those types, pictures, or shadows. The salvation was where? In what those things pointed to. Listen, I, do you believe this? Abraham believed on him who justified the ungodly. No, what does that mean? He didn't even have the tabernacle. He didn't have the Passover lamb. He didn't have any of the law of God. I'm thankful on our Bible minute Wednesday night Bible study. Oh, uh, oh, Robert Higby, I just love him. I got to where I love him more and more the more time I spend with him. He's he's a smart guy. He really is. And knows history like nobody's business. But he, he made a statement the other day. And, I, and if, I, if I ever do it again. And I told Bill this. If, if I took away one thing from the Bible study this last Wednesday night is it. I'm going to quit calling it the moral law of God. It's the law of God. All of it. The Ten Commandments. The 635 is not the moral law and the ceremonial law. It was all the law of God. Moses didn't have the law of God. He didn't have the 10. He didn't have the 635. But he still believed on him who justified the ungodly. So you tell me how the law had anything to do with that. Oh, we got to put the law back up if we want people saved. That man believed God without a law. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That was many years before Abraham. He didn't even have the covenant of circumcision. Right? And I guarantee you, when Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, it can be equally said of him that Noah believed on him who justified the ungodly. And people don't like to hear that kind of language, but listen, that man Noah didn't deserve life any more than those that the verse before it said Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord divert than those people that was written of them and him that every thought of man's imagination was only evil and that continually. Next verse. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So he's pointing out to them that the new covenant Infinitely exceeded the old covenant. And we were looking last week at how it exceeds it. And I had showed you previously that the two things about it. First of all, it was an unconditional promise. We saw that in verse 9. 
And secondly, in verses 10 through 13, if we want to finish up today, we started looking at it the last couple of times and didn't get very far. It's an absolute promise. Because notice what he says here in verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with those the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and will write them in their hearts. Do you know all 635 of the laws of God? Do you even all know, know all 10? Do you know, can you, can you if I ask you, I, I, I think I could, but I'm not certain that I could. I don't think I could tell you all 10. If, you, if I had to write, you, if I gave you a piece of paper and said, write down the 10 commandments, can you write all 10 of them down? In order, the way they were stated. Huh? He says here under that new covenant, he's going to write the law where? In their hearts and in their minds. What kind of law are we talking about? Here's the law. For the law of the spirit of the life, uh, the law of the, I, 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 I hate this. <laughs> and I just thought this morning I was, I, I was cleaning the coffee pot and I had these little, Cuisinart has these little filters and I had bought some three years ago and I looked all up in the top and I couldn't find them and, and I thought, Hold on, wait. I put them in the closet. I went in there and be dead gum. They were in the closet. And I thought to myself, boy, I'm getting smart. My, I don't have Alzheimer's. And that big, get up here, a verse I've quoted for 35 years I can't remember. Here we go. Listen. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Which laws he write in my heart? The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's the one he writes. He writes that in your heart. Writes that in your mind and in your conscience and in your understanding. And see, here's the thing. When you and I truly see God's law and justice that it demands from you and me, it demands from, from our God, that God this, this law of God, this law that formally demanded our condemnation and death, now what does it demand? Huh? Demands our life. Based on what? Our performance of it? Our love of it? Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he loved the law of God. We do. But just because we love it don't mean we, we can keep it. It demands our blessedness Based on the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we see that, I tell you what, that draws our affection out toward him. And not vice versa. A religion puts the proverbial horse before the cart, don't they? No, the cart, cart before the horse. <laughs> Got it backwards. <laughs> and see, here's the thing. When we see that that law and justice of God that formerly demanded our condemnation now demands our justification based on the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we, for the first time, truly see him as both a just God and a Savior, and we can look to him, listen to this, we can look to him as a loving Heavenly Father for our salvation in its entirety based on Christ and his righteousness alone. We can see and understand that God can justify us in terms of strict justice and according to truth. And with that being said, our, our affections... Our love to our Christ, where does it come from? It comes from a sure and certain knowledge that I'm already saved, that I'm already qualified, that I'm already entitled to, and I've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus before I take that first step by way of any kind of obedience. And see, this is the thing. When the Lord teaches us that, we repent. Peter wrote, the Lord's not... Well, there it is again. 
The Lord's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. But his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many of God's children are going to repent? Every one of them. Every one of them. Does that mean they're going to walk the aisle to Mr. Charles Finney's mourner bench in the front and sit there and weep and wail and gnash their teeth as they confess this long list and litany of things that they have and have not done? Is that what repentance is? It's what they taught us. Isn't that what they taught you in church? They'd look at us and they'd tell us, if you hadn't wept over your sins, the Lord ain't dealt with you. You, you know, you ever know any men or women? There might be some out there. I don't. It's more prevalent. You ever seen some men that they just don't cry? They just don't. They're just not emotional. They're just stoic. Some of the greatest leaders that we ever had as a country, they were men that were just staunch in their conviction. Just never showed fear. Never any worry, never ever any anxiety, never any emotion. I mean, I'd hate to be emotionless, but I mean, but you don't have to weep outwardly for you to have a broken heart. So, when David cries out, because and that's the thing, false religion gets us into this mindset where we see old David out there just woo, 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 just crying and weeping and mourning. Listen. Esau wept, he sought repentance and wept bitterly. And he found no place of repentance. So it, and I tell you, you look at Jacob, you go back and you read the narrative of Jacob. I see a lot more remorse in Jacob outwardly. Look at him when his brother, he was going to meet his brother that time. And he thought, because Esau must have beat him up a lot when he was little. He was scared to death of Esau. Esau was a man. We know from the scripture Esau was a man's man, right? I mean, he was a big burly hunter, and Jacob was a mama's boy, right? Mama favored Jacob. Daddy favored, because daddy liked the things that Esau did, and mama cared for the things that, that Jacob did. And so Jacob goes out there to meet his brother, who he knew he had got over on when he stole his birthright. That's what his name was anyhow. Jacob, which means the schemer, deceiver. And so, what does he do? He's filled with fear. Sends gifts to him. Sends his servants out with gifts. Go load him down with gifts where he won't get me. I don't see that kind of remorse. And I see him wrestling with God, with our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord tells him, let me go. And he says, well, he t touches the hollow of his hip and throws his hip out of joint. And what does Jacob tell him? He says, this ain't, this ain't tears. He says, this is, this is God-given faith. I will not let you go unless you bless me. He didn't have to cry out really for that to be occurring. But we get this mindset that if you don't have you don't have some kind of physical outpouring of emotion and grief over what you've done or what you hadn't done, that that it's not the spirit working in you. When the reality is, this, the lot the, the spirit shows us where where's your life at? That your life is hid with God in Christ. So we repent. What do we repent of? Well, what did I repent of? I think that'd be the question in my, in my own life. Personally, what did I repent of? Well, the first time in false religion, I repented of everything that men considered sin and that I myself by nature considered sin. But yet when the Lord revealed himself to me as the Lord my righteousness years ago, back out at that old church that we were at out yonder, you know what I repented of? All my dead works that I was that I 
thought that I was saved based on what I had accomplished in my life by way of obedience and reformation. My stars, I was a preacher. Prayed numerous hours. Had $4,000 worth of books on my shelf. It proved I was dedicated. And so I, we repent, first of all, of all our attempts at religion and morality aimed at the ground of salvation. But here's the second thing we repent of. We repent of our former idolatry. What's that? That God who accepted that iniquity and counted it as something. Because that's the God that I used to serve. That God, what did he put stock in? What the sinner does. So what is he? He's an idol because that's attributing to God qualities of character that do not belong to him. Listen, he will by no means clear the guilty. You can't do anything to get the guilt off. And so if you're claiming that the things that you do gets the guilt off, what are you saying? God will in fact clear the one that's guilty if he can clear himself or herself. So the question is this, how can you and I be sure our faith's genuine? How can you know today beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have the faith of God's elect? Can you know? Should you know? How, how can you, because I, I get this question a lot from people that can touch with me out there on the internet. I even got it from some of, some of our brethren here at the church. And the question is, how, how can you know that you hadn't just given mental agreement to some doctrinal truth? And that you don't possess true God-given faith. How can you know the difference? Well, here's the thing. The scriptures tell us to examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. In other words, see if your faith is genuine. Now, you say, oh God, here we go. He's fixed to start telling us to start looking at things we've done. Now, that's, that's what religion tells you. Like Bill said, I think he said it here the last, the last time I was here, May of last year, that we got this slide and scale. And it's different for every one of us. Some of us it slides more one way, and some of it slides the other way. But here's the thing. True God-given faith, folks, it's always accompanied by true God-given repentance, which is a radical change of mind concerning our former idolatry and our former dead works. And you can't accomplish that on your own. No more than Lot's wife could prevent herself from looking back. Where was Lot looking? Forward. Where's she looking? Back that. No, not a lot, a lot of people said, well, her heart was back over there. Well, sure enough, her heart was back over there. Ain't no doubt about it. But her heart wasn't with that God that Lot was going out there after. She didn't believe the same God as Lot. Now, f folk, that wasn't a woman that lost anything other than her own soul. She did not lose her salvation. She was never saved. That woman was a reprobate from the beginning, just like the rest of those people over in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was said of her husband, it what? Delivered just Lot. A just man. She lived with a just man. It didn't rub off on her. <laughs> and everyone, I had one, I had one, one person call me one time and said that somebody told him that they wanted their, wanted their kids raised around other religious kids. It would be a better influence on them. Really? You want your children moral or you want them saved? You want them to have good character? I want mine to have good character. I'm grateful for the character they got. But is that all you want? For them to be upstanding, fine citizens that people respect and hold in high esteem and speak kindly of them, talk about the fact that ain't nobody as kind and compassionate and loving and giving and as benevolent as what he or she is. And yet miss the righteousness of God in Christ. 
What good is it to a man or woman's soul if they gain the whole world and lose their only soul? You only got one. Just one. If you or I are truly in the way that's straight and narrow, and you listen to this, if we are truly in the way that's straight and narrow, we see that Every other way leads to just one place. When you passed all them churches driving down here today, are y'all coming up? Are you and I as we drove in? We, you, we drive by a slew of them, just in Ruston. What do you think? And it's, it's not, people say, well, y'all are so proud. Y'all, y'all think y'all the only ones that are saved. It ain't got nothing to do with me thinking anything about me. This ain't pride. I, I tell you what, I guarantee you, outwardly, character and conduct wise, I guarantee you for the most part, most of these people in these religious places, I don't hold a candle to them, Kenny. You know, it ought not be that way. I, I ought to be the most benevolent. That's one of the things I like about these guys that I read that, are so clear on the gospel, these old men, William Huntington in particular. And they said William Huntington was an antinomian. He hated the law of God. Go read. If you want to, you want to read a story of a man who knew the Lord and didn't think any of his knowledge of the Lord and him being the Lord had anything to do with anything that he ever did or was enabled to do, go read William Huntington's story of his life. But you read of his benevolence and his love and his care and his concern for not only his brethren in Christ, but for all men and women without exception. Folks, we're doing the greatest thing that we can do to put the gospel out there for, God's, for, for people's souls. Isn't that, isn't, that, isn't that about the best work that you can do? Do you want anything for it? No, I want God to be glorified and honored in the salvation of your children and your grandchildren, and my grandchild, and my friends, and my family. But I don't want any of them saved in a way that dishonors God's character and His conduct. That brings any kind of disgrace upon the fact that God is just, and He will by no means clear the guilty, and at the same time, He's a Savior of sinner. I don't want my kids saved, and I, don't want my, I, love, I love Zoe to death. I told a guy this week. I love my granddaughter and my son and everybody else can testify how much I love that little girl. But I don't love her so much that I will include her into the kingdom of God by some false profession that she would ever make. I hope she never does. That's why you keep your kids away from that mess. And I tell you what, you let them, flock, let them flock with it. Let them be friends with it. Let them run with it. Now, I guarantee you, before long, you, have a, you already got a rebel on your hands. Now, they might be a better rebel than the other rebel, but if they don't know God, they're rebels. They, listen, unless the Lord reveals himself, they are enemies of God. Even your children, even little Zoe. Huh? He said, ooh. Other grandparents might say, ooh, don't say that about your granddaughter. Do you know her, man? Love her to death. Ain't nobody taught that child a lie. She, she leads a pack. She looked at me this week, and I asked her, she gets in the car every, every day when I pick her up from school, what color did you get? Because they, they give them a color every day of what, how their day was, from pinks to top. Red, you get to, get to go visit the principal. And there's all these variety of colors in between. You got pink, you got pink, then purple, then blue, then green, then orange, then red. She got in the car and I said, what color did you get today? I got green, Papa. I said, you did? Yeah, I got green, Papa. We got to the house, I pulled her folder out. You know what color she got? She got yellow. And I said, Zoe, you got yellow today. No, I got green, Papa. I said, no, you got yellow. I said, Zoe, that's one away from being in the red and going to the principal. Then she went to justify it. You know what her next words were? Papa, and I, she, she did prove me wrong. 
there's orange in between yellow and, and red. And she said, no, Papa, I still got orange to go. And I said, but you told me you got green. <laughs> now, who taught her how to do that? Huh? I, the, the scriptures are the testimony and the guideline for everything. The wicked go forth from the womb. Speaking lies. Didn't that, nobody touched, Matt didn't say nothing. You, you tell your papa if he asked you what color, tell him a different color where he won't get angry. She just knew in her mind. She, she knows what we know by nature, self-preservation. What's good for us, period. And I tell you, this will always in, in varying degrees produce a, a sincere loyalty to Christ and a desire to see our loved ones brought into that straight and narrow way. Again, we, we have to see that this, this, this that we're talking about to him writing his law in our hearts and in our minds, it's a miracle of grace, folks. It's not mysticism. It's not dreams. It's not visions. It's not voices. It's not God telling me something other than what he tells me in this word. And I'll tell you this, true God-given love, what does it do? It begets love. We love him, and we do. Why? Because he first loved us. And he tells us here, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. What is it? He's talking about spiritual Israel. Not talking about Israel over there. Not talking about national Israel, the one that he had made that former covenant with. It was a conditional covenant with promises that if they were obedient, they'd get blessings. If they were disobedient, they'd be cursed for it. So when he says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel, who's he talking about? He's talking about all who believe, all who rest in Christ. And see, that's the thing. You and I, we enter into this covenant with God when we agree by his grace to the terms of the covenant. We take him at his word. What's the terms of the covenant? All our springs are in him. This is the name wherewith she shall be called Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. All who hear the promise, everybody who hears it, are fully warranted. And they're commanded, and they're responsible to believe the promise. In verse 11, when look, at what, look at what it says in verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for, they, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. I think a verse like this is one of the most dangerous verses that ever fell into the hands of primitive Baptists. Because they think you don't need any means to be saved. And they, they'll use that as a defense for it. You don't have to teach. God just zaps. It's like a whoop, just turns it on and off out of heaven. But, but see, you've got to understand what he says here in verse 11 uh, comparatively, not absolutely. <laughs> you say, what do you mean by that? Well, the comparison here is under the new covenant, there's going to be a striking contrast of the fullness of the revelation to the ignorance which characterized those that were under that old covenant. Mainly in this way, the manner of teaching. See, back then, what did they not have? They didn't have the Word of God. They had the Old Testament, some of it. Most of them individually didn't have it. They didn't have the prophets. They didn't have the Psalms. So what he says here in verse 11, it's not saying that there'll be no need of teaching under the new covenant. Because he's already stated back over in chapter 5, remember what he said, when the times when you ought to be teaching others, what do you have to be doing? What needs to be, you need, when you, when you ought to be eating meat, what are you having to eat on? I got to give you pablum. So we, there, there's a necessity for teachers. We know that from Ephesians chapter 4. That he gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastor teachers for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the, for the maturing of the saints. How do you get that? By teaching, by instruction, by guidance. 
But what it's shown us here is that that revelation of the divine will and purpose is going to be far more extensive and clear under the new covenant than it ever was under the old covenant. Under the old covenant, what was it taught? Abraham saw Christ through that lamb. Now, what do we have? We have the word of God where we hear and read John say, when he saw Christ coming, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Also, it means this, that under the new covenant, there's an enlarged communication of the enlightening influence of the Holy Spirit. You can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, where he talks about the glory that excelleth. I, I don't know how to explain that, but I know this much. There was a time when they believed, but they had not received the Spirit. Now, I, I don't, I, we, that's, that's a sermon for another day. We'll get into that at some other point in time. But after Pentecost, it was different. And it was. Because he says this, notice the next, for they shall all know me. And under that old covenant, the vast majority of the nation of Israel, what did they do? Did they know him? No, they continued not. They didn't continue in the knowledge of God that was taught to them. And they didn't continue in the truth that the law had given them. The law was their tutor to drive them where? To Christ. But instead, where did they go? For the most part, where the national Israel gets stuck at. Same place most of our friends and family stuck at today. Where at? The law. Trying to keep it. But see, under the new covenant, every one of God's elect, spiritual Israel, they'll know and they'll continue in the covenant because what is it? It's an absolute, unconditional covenant freely given by God to the object of his love. And see, here's the thing that you got to realize. He's making a comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant. The new covenant Unconditional, absolute. The old covenant, conditional covenant, right? Condition on Israel's national obedience. And if that doesn't teach us anything else, one thing we ought to get from the scriptures is this. Every covenant in the scripture, every one of them, that's conditioned on man in any way, to any degree, at any time, is a testimony of man's failure. It's, a, it's like a monument. All, every one of them are monuments to men's failure to meet the terms and conditions of the covenant. We have to look somewhere else. Look at verse 13. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. If you want to know about that verse, go listen to the sermon I preached last week. I'm not going to come back and teach this all over again. Look at verse 13. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first covenant old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. The old covenant has done two things, and we'll close with this this morning. First of all, the old covenant, it served as a, its purpose as a figure and as a schoolmaster. It was there for a point in time for an appointed purpose until the promised seed came and then what happened? It was done away. With. It fulfilled its purpose. You think about it. Through the time of the giving of the law until the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God, our God did use his law, his holy law, as a schoolmaster that brought his people to true faith and true repentance, led them to see what was promised and purposed and typified and foreshadowed in all of it. But here's the second thing that that old covenant did. It also clearly shows that it couldn't serve the grand purpose of providing eternal salvation. If salvation could have come by the law, if righteousness could have been brought in by the law, then what would God not have to do? So it, it removed out of the way, according to God's will and purpose, God removed it, and he removed it for how long? It, and folk, it had an un, honorable end in that everything that it required, remember what our Lord said? 
Think not that I came to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy it. What I did, I came to fulfill it. For not one jot or one tittle shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Right? Did he do it? Well, we know he cried on the cross that one word translated three English words, which is the same word fulfilled there in that text that I've just quoted to you. He cried, Teleos, it is finished. And then Paul verified that all the requirements of the law for every one of God's elect was fulfilled in Christ in Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every man that believes it. And see, here's the thing. Christ redeemed those of his people who were under that covenant from its curse. How did he do it? By becoming a curse for them. In their stead. Why? That the blessings of Abraham might not just come on his elect from Israel, but where? On true spiritual Israel, his elect among the Gentiles, and that that new covenant might be established and ratified by the God-sent Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one sent into the world to fully ratify and Im 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 implicate or put into practice that new covenant under which we find ourselves. Okay, we're done with chapter 8. Lord willing, we'll come back, pick up chapter 9 next week. You're dismissed to worship. I appreciate your presence.